Hello! Today I'm going to talk about relaxation oscillators. A relaxation oscillator charges a capacitor through a resistor, and when that capacitor reaches a predetermined voltage, it triggers a switching circuit which will discharge the capacitor. And that switching circuit has a property called hysteresis such that it will not reopen and allow that capacitor to start charging again until it reaches another voltage which is significantly below the voltage that caused it to discharge the capacitor in the first place. So let's take a look at an old time relaxation oscillator that used a neon light as the switching circuit. So the neon light, which I will simply draw the schematic for it, which will be looks like a capacitor in a glass tube with a little dot to tell us that there is a gas inside there. And that is going to be across a capacitor. And that will go through a resistor to a voltage source. And if this is an NE2 bulb, it will have a trigger voltage of about 90 volts. So let's make this uh, plus 125 volts. So it's kind of a high voltage type of circuit, but there are low voltage ways to do this also. And we'll just put this to ground, very simple circuit here, and our output will be across that neon bulb. So what's going to happen is, of course, we're going to have a current flowing through the capacitor as it charges. This also looks like a capacitor, but a much smaller one. And as this capacitor charges, when it gets up to approximately plus 90 volts, it's going to ionize the gas inside the neon tube. When that gas ionizes, it becomes conductive. So up to this point, this was non-conductive, so the capacitor was allowed to charge. And now when this reaches 90 volts, the gas becomes conductive, and it will now discharge the capacitor through the light. And once again, this has a property called hysteresis. In this case, it's a type of negative resistance, which simply means that as this current increases, instead of the voltage going up, such as across a resistor. So a resistor, as our current increases, we expect the voltage to go up. But with negative resistance, as that current increases, the voltage goes down. So that's a property in a lot of relaxation oscillators is negative resistance, and that is something that we have here. When that triggers, the higher current combined with the negative resistance causes the voltage to drop considerably, allowing the capacitor to discharge until it gets to a lower threshold voltage, at which time this gas will unionize and become a regular gas again. And so then this becomes a very high resistance and that will allow that capacitor to start charging again. So what we will see is this light will not be lit. The voltage goes up and up and up and at 90 volts, this is going to trigger and that's going to light up. We're going to see that neon bulb light up and while it's lit, it has a very low resistance and so that's going to discharge. It'll discharge very quickly and then that light will go out and this will no longer be ionized and then that will climb up again. So we'll get a voltage that looks something like this. It climbs and climbs and climbs, hits the trigger voltage at positive 90 volts and then suddenly drops down to a lower voltage. And at that voltage, the gas becomes unionized. Resistance increases. Now the capacitor is allowed to charge and then we'll then discharge, charge and then discharge. So we get basically a little bit of a curvy triangle wave out of that particular type of oscillator. So that may be the simplest oscillator you can build is using a neon discharge tube to make a very simple relaxation oscillator. Another type of relaxation oscillator that used to be very popular used a device that is no longer manufactured called a unijunction transistor. I talk about those back in the solid state devices class. And once again, the unijunction transistor has negative resistance such that once you hit a certain current threshold, it will suddenly go into a state where increasing the current causes the voltage to go down. So it acts very similar to that neon light. So if we have a unijunction transistor, symbol looks something like that. And we'll put our capacitor here and our charging resistor there. And there's our output. 
So as the voltage across this capacitor goes up, we reach a predetermined voltage that this will suddenly go into its negative resistance. So suddenly it becomes a path to discharge the capacitor. So the capacitor discharges rapidly, but once it goes below that certain voltage, it goes out of its negative resistance characteristic and becomes a high impedance again and allows this capacitor to charge again. And just like the neon light type of relaxation oscillator, we're going to get a voltage across this capacitor. This could be used as the output that looks something like charge, discharge, charge, discharge, charge, discharge. Once again, a curvy triangle wave or curvy sawtooth wave. If I said triangle, I meant sawtooth, a curvy sawtooth wave that comes off of that. And here's a diagram of a working relaxation oscillator using a unijunction transistor. Once again, uh, they do make something like that. I forgot exactly what it's called, but they're kind of rare and they don't make the regular unijunction transistor anymore. But if you find one as old stock, you can make this particular circuit. And once again, it's a very simple oscillator, just simply charging and discharging that capacitor using the negative resistance property of the unijunction transistor. Now, a much more common relaxation oscillator we'll see these days is made with a operational amplifier. And I have another video where I go into a lot more detail on this particular circuit, analyzing it moment by moment, which is worth looking at, but I'm gonna look at it in a more simple way at this point, but we have a operational amplifier. We haven't talked about those yet, but I will just quickly say how it works. We have two inputs and an output, and the idea is that if the non-inverting input has a higher voltage than the inverting input, the output is going to rise, and it will rise until one of two conditions is met. Either it can't go any higher because of the supply voltage, so let's put the supply voltage here whatever those voltages are. It goes up to this voltage or as close as it can get. That's as far as it's going to go. Or if these two inputs become equal, it will stabilize at that particular voltage. And if the inverting input voltage is higher than the non-inverting input voltage, the output voltage will go down until one of two things happen. Either it hits this lower voltage or as close as it can go, or they become equal. So there's a lot we can do with the circuit that I'll talk about in detail down the road. So if I hook this circuit up this way, I'm gonna just get the power supply out of there to reduce the clutter. What I'm going to do is put a resistor here and a capacitor here, ground that. That's going to go to the inverting input and to the non-inverting input, I will put those two resistors. And this one's a little bit tricky to figure out exactly how it's going to work because the oscillating frequency is controlled by this resistor and that capacitor plus the ratio of these two resistors. So it's not as straightforward as it might be. There are ways to calculate it out. I've never done it. I've just experimented around to get what I wanted. But here's the basic circuit. And so what do we have? Do we have the elements we need for an oscillator? Well, we have our positive feedback coming from the output to here. There's that. We have our amplification. But of course, our amplification is greater than one, so it's going to saturate and give us square waves. And so our output will be here. Once again, if you want to see a detailed description of how this works, you can look at my other video that I have in the description below. But we have the elements we need. We have our positive feedback and we have our timing circuits and our delays and everything else we need. So this is going to charge up as current flows that way. And when it reaches a certain voltage, which is determined ultimately by this voltage ratio, but it also depends on the supply voltage. While this is charging, let's say that our voltage here is at 10 volts. That's at five volts, so plus five plus 10, this is charging up. What's going to happen when this reaches five volts? So it's charging, 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 less than five, less than five. When it reaches five volts, well, this voltage becomes higher than that voltage when it passes five volts. So it's going to trigger this to drop suddenly to minus 10 volts. That will suddenly become minus five volts. And so now we have minus 10 volts here. So that's going to discharge the capacitor. 
as current flows into the operational amplifier in this direction. As that discharges, voltage is going to go down, 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 go past zero and keep going down. So we have that hysteresis here. When that changed to minus 10 volts, suddenly the trigger voltage changed to minus 5 volts. So it goes down, down, down. And so when the voltage here discharges down to zero volts, nothing happens. But it keeps going down. When it finally reaches minus 5 volts, it's going to trigger it so that this jumps back up to plus 10 volts. And this will also go to plus 5 volts. And so that's going to cause the the amplifier to switch polarities and start charging that capacitor again. I am kind of glossing over here because I do have a video in my series on operational amplifiers linked in the description below where I explain it in much more detail, but that's the basic idea. So we end up with the same thing happening again as we look at the output. Here we'll get this that triangle wave like we did before. A little more, well, the symmetry depends on something else we'll talk about in just a second. We get that triangle or sawtooth wave. Here, because it goes plus 10, minus 10, plus 10, minus 10, we get a nice little square wave out of it. Assuming that, well, that this is grounded, but if we do this, make that a variable resistor and run that to ground, now, as we change this variable resistor, I don't remember off the top of my head which way to go, and I don't want to try to remember and figure it out right now, but basically, as we move that, we move it one way, it's going to shorten the duty cycle, so the charge and discharge will become more like charge, discharge, charge, discharge, causing our duty cycle to become short. And if we move that the other way, it's going to change this more to like a charge, discharge, charge, discharge, changing our duty cycle to longer pulses. The duty cycle being how much time it's at one voltage compared to the other voltage. So there's a long duty cycle compared to a short duty cycle. Of course, unfortunately, doing that also changes the frequency that it operates at, so it may not be a practical thing to do, but it is something that will work. But this is a popular relaxation oscillator because it's very easy to build very easy to make work. It works uh, at audio frequencies very well and depending on the operational amplifier can work up into megahertz or maybe even higher. So it's just a capacitor here to control the time and then a voltage divider to the non-inverting input to give us our positive feedback. And once again it works on that principle of hysteresis. Uh, no negative resistance here but it works on the hysteresis where the trigger point starts at a positive voltage then it changes to a negative voltage, back to a positive voltage, acting like a relaxation oscillator and giving us that square wave output. So that's the basics of how relaxation oscillators work. They're very easy to build. And here's a schematic with components you can give a try if you'd like to make one of these. They're very simple and almost foolproof. So that's about all there is to say about relaxation oscillators. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up subscribe and hit that gray bell when you do so that you get notified when I put up new videos. And if you want to learn electronics and perhaps become a certified electronics technician or get a jump start in your studies in electrical engineering, you can go to vocademy.net and take my free course. To help me put these videos online and keep Vocademy free, you can go to patreon.com slash vocademy and pledge your support or go to support.vocademy.net and see other ways you can help me out. Big thank you to my patrons at Patreon and my other donors. Could not do this without your help, and thanks to everyone for watching.